trying to put the sticker to tell me to put on the camera. That way, I'm gonna keep looking here, and that's not at you, that's you. There we go. Look at the camera. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Troy, the creative behind Fox and Oak Designs, and this is the Worst of Fiber podcast. Uh, I just want to quickly mention why there wasn't a podcast there last week. Um, if you don't have notifications turned on, you probably didn't see the quick little community post that I made. Um, so uh, if you're subscribed and you haven't hit the notification bell, go ahead and press that so that way you can get those community posts uh, directly to your device, your phone, your uh, iPad or other tablet or whatever, your laptop. Um, and if you're not subscribed, why don't you do both? <laughs> anyway, the reason why there wasn't a podcast last week is that I had some technical difficulties. I made the mistake of taking my microphone here and putting it onto my table on my desk here. And unfortunately, that caused all the reverberations from this apartment, the next apartment, and everything below to reverberate up through <laughs> the desk into the microphone. Um, plus, uh, since the microphone was a lot further away from my face and I didn't have um, noise canceling or noise uh, isolation, I think is what it's actually called, turned onto the microphone, it, you could hear the echoing around my room. So I just, the quality was just, was, was just not something I was willing to put out on YouTube. Uh, and then on top of that, like when I started recording it, like I remembered how all over the place I was when it came to trying to explain my thoughts doing the Lace Masterclass, all of those things. Um, so what I've done this week, I know I've mentioned that I have started doing like an outline. I have an outline and I have a script this week. Uh, so I'm gonna put that back down. All right, I have a script this week. <laughs> so if I keep looking over here, I'm looking at my script. Um, I'll try to keep that to a minimum though. So that way um, this still feels like a, uh, like a, like stream of thought conversation sort of thing. I only have a few things scripted. Uh, the rest of it is just in point form. So we'll see how this works out. If it works out really well, I'm going to continue doing it. And uh, if it doesn't, then I'll try something new. <laughs> just just trying to take some of the pressure off, right? Um, so uh, da, 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 da. yeah, I had wrote down the details of this. So recorded on Oh, yes. So I had recorded it on Friday. Uh, because um, I had forgotten that I was going to be taking some vacation time there because of Islander Day, which was last week um, here in Prince Edward Island. We have uh, a holiday in February. It's a stat holiday, um, just like Christmas or New Year's or Remembrance Day. Uh, we have one in February called Islander Day. Uh, Nova Scotia has a similar holiday on the same day called Heritage Day or Nova Scotia Heritage or Family something or other. It's on your screen. <laughs> but it's, it's effectively the same thing. So we don't get a civic holiday in PEI, we get Islander Day. And I had decided to go over to Nova Scotia for the weekend. Uh, and it just so happens that that lined up with the podcast upload date. And I was planning on leaving on Sunday and coming back Tuesday, which normally I record on Sundays. <laughs> edit on Mondays, uh, and then upload it there Monday afternoon. But because I was going to be away for the weekend, I tried uh, edit, uh, tried editing, I tried recording the podcast on Friday. So that way, during like the little breaks I had through the day on Saturday, so lunchtime uh, for because I work on Saturdays from nine to five, lunchtime break, uh, had about a half hour between, <laughs> between, uh, you know, by the time I would get to town to hang out with my friends for D&D, uh, take another hour, so on and so forth, just like split it up into little pieces throughout the day, and uh, edit the podcast, finish editing it on Sunday, uh, render it, upload it, like all of the things that just take time it doesn't take effort, it just like it, those kinds of things I was going to do on on Sunday. But when I opened it up there Saturday at lunchtime, I get through the first 10 minutes of the podcast, and I had enough could not deal with it. Um, so I've kind of decided it's a blessing in disguise because I would have been so stressed that day. Uh, <laughs> trying to keep the podcast uh, or try to editing editing the podcast while not neglecting everything else that I'm supposed to be doing that day. Um, so uh, I actually had a chance to enjoy my weekend. So uh, <laughs> sorry that this is coming out a week late, but 
uh, I hope that the podcast is a, a little bit more structured in, in the sense that uh, I'm not going to be talking in circles. I won't be stopping short. I won't be fact checking because I was trying to remember something that I had written down weeks ago. Um, well, a week ago at that point. <laughs> so yeah, that's very good. While reading the script, I'm going to still try to knit and talk and teach and make jokes <laughs> at the same time. Let's see if I can actually multitask like that. Uh, so today I decided that uh, I'd do a bit of a question and answer. I had done a different topic last week about drop spindles, but I'm going to get a few more of those before I talk to, about them at length because I only have two drop spindles um, and I feel like I should have a few more to, uh, to really give you a lot of information on drop spindles. And so I've got a few questions here. Um, so the first one is from Carol Gagne. Gagne? Gagne? I am going to butcher names. I am so sorry. <laughs> um, so the, her question was, so to give you some context, because I realized after just copy and pasting the question, there it doesn't make any sense. So this particular question was on um, the last finished object podcast that I did at the uh, third week of January, where I showed off my um, Freddie Beach socks and talked about the cast on that I used. Um, so the cast on that I used was the Pearl Soha cast on. And Carol asks, speaking of sewing the gap shut, which is the cast off that I did, or cast on I did rather, did you do the cast on flat, then only start in the round when you started the ribbing? And the answer to that is yes. So um, to do this particular tubular cast on, I followed the Pearl Soho's directions on a tubular cast on to the letter. So I cast on exactly how they recommend, um, and they recommend casting on and working the first two rows uh, flat, and then you join in the round. And that causes a little bit of a gap there at the beginning and end of your like rows where like you've been moving back and forth. So I did sew that up a little bit. I didn't do a perfect job. Um, <laughs> Cause I, like, it, it's one of those things that like the stitches would normally go in a particular direction, but trying to get them to link up in such a way that makes it seamless was almost impossible. I'm still going to try a few other things on my next pair of socks, but um, I didn't get it perfect for this last one. Uh, thank you, Carol, for that question. Uh, the next one uh, was a question uh, from Esther Van Gorder. Uh, where in Halifax did you get the Chiaogu shorties? So those were the needles that I was using for that particular sock. And I had also mentioned it in the last podcast that I'm going to be using my Chiaogu shorties for the cuff for the, my sweater here. So I got my Chiaogu shorties at the um, L and K, or sorry, LK yarns, not L and K, LK yarns there in the Hydrostone there in Halifax. It's a lovely little yarn shop, um, yarn floor to ceiling. And then towards the back near the cash register, there's like a, a needle section where they have some really beautiful needles and some of them include Chiaogu. So I bought like a little tester pack for a 2.25 millimeter where I got two different uh, tip lengths and I got two different cord lengths that I can mix and match to make everything from a nine inch or a 23 centimeter um, circular needle all the way up to 12 inch 30 centimeters on these particular needles. I was even recommended by uh, the lady who was behind me in, uh, in the line. She said that she actually mixes, there's a two inch and a three inch um, needle tips and she says that she mixes them so that way she's using a two inch and a three inch on the same needle so that way the three inch is the one that she is holding to work from so this needle so in my case my right needle and the shorter needle is the left needle the one that she's working from so that way she has a little bit more control on her working needle instead of the um her offhand needle so I did try that. I didn't like that. Um, I prefer having the same length. In fact, I liked having the short tips on the short cable best for my socks because that makes a, a nine inch or 23 centimeter socks. And that's the size sock that I make for myself. So uh, that's, that's what I, uh, I've been doing. But thank you. Uh, I don't know your name. If you watch the podcast, if you remember me from uh, last year, <laughs> giving me that piece of uh, um, uh, that tip. Thank you. Um, I tried it. Not my favorite thing. But I'm I'm happy for the <laughs> happy for the tip. Thanks and thanks again, Esther, for the the question. Now, do I need to decrease, increase? One two three, decrease one two three. No, next one. Uh, so Linda Stewart asked my next question. Um, again, this was the episode of Finished Objects because I pointed out that I was going to be doing uh, a pattern that I'm going to be doing uh, using some of my Malabrigo sock yarn, the uh, Queen Shawl, Queen Lay Shawl. I'll, I'll I'll put it back up on the screen here. 
Uh, and she's asking, uh, where did you buy your Malabrigo sock yarn? Is there any stores on the island carrying it? So Linda is a local uh, <laughs> from uh, in the Belfast area. Uh, she comes to the shop quite often. She used to come to my shop in Montague before I closed that down. Um, and to answer your question, Linda, uh, to my knowledge, there are no stores on Prince Edward Island that hold any Malabrigo yarn whatsoever. Um, I know I stocked a little bit in my own store, um, mostly the lace weight and the uh, the worsted Rasta, the, the single ply, and I had some sport weight too, but I didn't have any Malabrigo sock and I never ended up buying more. So unfortunately my shop is closed and I was the only place that sold that yarn. Um, but I bought mine at the Woolen Tart in Wolfville, Nova Scotia last May, or not last, last May, last March, when I went on my little buying trip where I bought the Chiaogu needles there at LK Yarns. Um, and I looked up on Malabriga's website and it turns out that the Woolen Tart or uh, the Woolen Tart and Gaspro Valley Fibers, which they're sister shops, they're owned by the same, uh, by the same uh, family. Um, that is the only place in Nova Scotia to buy Malabrigo yarn. Uh, and then uh, Cricket Cove in Black Harbor, New Brunswick is the only other place to buy Malabrigo sock yarn in the Maritimes. I didn't check, uh, I didn't check Newfoundland because, well, I mean, there's not a bridge to Newfoundland. <laughs> there's only a bridge to New Brunswick. Um, so those are the only two places in all of the Maritimes that are listed on Malabrigo's website about selling any yarn. I do know that the woolen tart specifically have their sock yarn and i believe they have their single ply worsted uh but uh their largest selection is the sock yarn i have not been at uh i haven't been at cricket cove so i couldn't tell you what they have might want to give them a call and <laughs> see what they've got linda uh thanks so much for the question though uh, so my next one is from Laura Sanderson, uh, and she asks, can you explain the difference between a slip slip knit and a knit two together through the back loop? So uh, they are similar in the fact that they decrease your stitches um, and they uh, like lay your stitches in the same orientation. So let me look at the camera here so I can see how this is working. So when you're knitting your knit two togethers, um, when you do your knit two together, what happens is your stitches lay on top of each other like this, right? Because you're knitting these two stitches together. Assuming that you are, oh, I need to reverse this. Ooh, <laughs> this is going to be tricky. Okay, so when you knit two stitches together, what you're going to see is if these, my hands are the two different stitches, uh, one stitch is going to lay on top of the other. And that's what creates that 45 degree angle. Um, if this section is... Uh, like I'm trying to think of this mirrored because I mirror this image here. I might have to turn the camera around. We'll see. But anyway, when you knit two stitches together, what's happening here is that you take these two stitches, then one lays on top of the other, and then they stack like this. So that way you have that angle going up this way because this stitch is sitting on top of it. When you slip slip knit, what happens is that this stitch lays on top, and that's what gives you the angle going the opposite direction. If you were to knit both your stitches, through the back loop, while the stitches would sit like this, just like the SSK, they'd be twisted. So they would actually look <laughs> like this. So just like when you knit through the back loop, you're adding a tiny little twist. So instead of your, your stitches going like this um, across, uh, I'll, I'll try to put a little image here on the screen here, but uh, there's kind of like a U sign uh, wave that uh, knitting takes, when you do a twisted stitch, like knitting through the back loop, you're actually adding a little twirl to it. And that causes the stitches to, or the stitch to not stretch as much. Um, and it's a great way to get a really clean and a really tight, really like, like a really tight ribbing to use twisted stitches in there. Um, but it doesn't have as much stretch as it would be otherwise. So when you knit two stitches through the back loop, you do get the orientations of the stitches in the right direction, like they're going this way, but you are twisting them. So there's gonna be a little twist on both of those stitches and there won't be as much stretch across those stitches. If you watch the uh, tutorial I did on Slip Slip K and like working with the twisted SSK, like you are twisting the back side of the stitch to make it lay flatter because it's not taking up as much space. You're at tightening that twist, uh, that stitch, but the other one is still not twisted. So that way it gives you the image, um, something closer to what, how neat uh, a knit two together. Cause I, I don't know about you guys, but you can tell 
<laughs> the difference between my knit two together to my slip slip knits because the gauge is a little bit different just because of how the stitches are sitting, how they're stretched out as I'm working them. Um, and they're different still when I do the slip one, pa uh, knit one, pass slip stitch over. All, a whole bunch of fun. <laughs> Uh, so thanks, Laura, for that uh, that great question. Um, if you're interested in seeing the actual difference in a piece of knitting, just comment back down to below. I'll do a quick little tutorial, um, just a quick little video on how that's different. I might even try to, I'll, I might even use that as a, an excuse to try out doing YouTube shorts. I've been interested in trying that. Uh, so just comment down below if you would like to see that video. Anyone, not just Laura. Not just Laura. <laughs> Uh, and my final question for the day is from Sadie uh, Granger. Gang, I think, hmm? did I write that down wrong? <laughs> no, I copied and pasted. Uh, it's Gagner, Gagner. It also looks like Gagne, but with an R at the end. Anyway, um, you want names for further episodes and then she gives me <laughs> a bunch of suggestions. Um, and that was on, uh, again, the finished object uh, episode that I did that I had done well more probably five weeks ago at this point. Uh, so uh, thank you for all the suggestions. I actually do like that, um, that um, format. I'm going to tweak it a little bit uh, because I don't want the problem with having such a long name that has the exact same thing over and over again um, is that if you're looking at like a cell phone notification or something where you can't see the entire title, um, all you're going to see is episode blah, <laughs> episode whip, uh, same word, same word, same word. It's just going to look like the same episode every time. Uh, and then I'll have to come up with a different thumbnail every time. Um, that is something that I plan to do in the future, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not super well versed with Photoshop. So I'm, I'm taking things as I go. I want to get this format under my belt before I, I start doing like all the fancy stuff. Uh, but thank you. Um, I will be doing something like that. I might drop the whole like episode one, episode two, that sort of thing that I did last season and what I've been doing this season, just so that way I can say, you know, I can do like FO podcast and then say like the different things that are in the podcast. Um, and now that I've got an outline um, and I have a spot for me to write notes in for when I edit the podcast the next day, um, I, I'll actually be able to remember what I talked about and <laughs> be able to come up with something instead of the uh, a play on the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe like I've done in a number of the episodes. <laughs> anyway, uh, so normally today would be a finished object um, podcast, but I haven't finished anything in well over a month. Uh, but to my credit, I haven't started anything either. Um, I've just been working away at different things. So I've been working um, on my Raga sweater. In fact, I'm going to uh, keep working at this as I talk about it. Uh, so this is my Raga sweater by uh, Violet McQuaid. Don't drop any stitches, Troy. I'll show you the front of it once again. Uh, so there is my sweater. Um, I It is by Violet McQuaid. It is written for, um, I, I realize I should be telling you this information too. It is written for uh, Jameson Spindrift yarn. I am using uh, Knit Picks palette. Um, if you want more information on the colors, please refer back to um, my podcast episode back in January, the uh, episode one <laughs> where I talked about this at length and, or sorry, it wasn't January, February. The podcast I put up three weeks ago. So uh, February, uh, the, February whip podcast. Uh, <laughs> I think that's what I might do is go month and then FO month whip. Anyway, um, and I go at, I, I tell you at length what colors I used in this. Um, love it. I'm just working on the, uh, the sleeve. I've got a little bit more done here. Um, I really only have one, uh, <laughs> one color, one, like one pattern um, done. Uh, I just, as I mentioned, I didn't really have much time to uh, knit or as much time as I'd like to denote to my knitting um, because I worked on this, I want to say, for a couple of hours last Tuesday and the last time before, uh, yeah, on Tuesday. And then the time before that was the Monday prior, not the day before, but the week before. So I just haven't had much time to uh, sit down and really knit. Um, and the time that I have been sitting down and uh, watching TV, I have been making the choice <laughs> of playing a video game instead of in, instead of knitting. Um, but I will, uh, I, I will try to balance my what I'm doing between the two things here now. 
Um, I am currently using my uh, Knit Picks, not, not Picks. Uh, I'm currently using my Knitter's Pride 3.25 16 inch circular needles. Um, I bought this uh, for a hat I did a little while ago. Um, and it just so happens that I have this needle. So I'm using it, it again. Um, and I will be continuing using this until my work is too small. Um, and then I will switch over to one of my Chiaogu shorties from the Chiaogu shorties that I bought from uh, Felice and Harmony back there uh, about a month and a half ago here now. <laughs> It'll be the first project that I work on with those is this one. So I'm pretty excited to get to that. Yeah, uh, so I'm gonna quickly put this down. And for, so my next project is um, the Silphide Jacket by Helene Arneson. And um, I'm working this using Belfast Mini Mills uh, Island Collection fingering um, in a colorway that's no longer available. Sorry, everyone, I bought the last nine balls. <laughs> Um, and it's coming along, um, so you should be able to see the bluebell pattern really starting to pop out here. Um, and it's just, it's such a cool little neat um, design that this this um, this pattern has, because like, it's just, I don't know, I can't say enough nice things about like the, the design. Um, I know I've been pretty harsh about like the size inclusivity about this particular pattern and the uh, less than ideal listings for how much yarn it requires, um, because apparently there's only a 50 gram difference between uh, the smallest size and the largest size, uh, and you only need six balls for the largest size. Um, that's that's it's not entirely true, but anyway. Um, other than other than that one thing, really, which isn't now that I've worked out the pattern, um, it's it's not even a thing anymore. Um, yeah, I'm really, really enjoying it. It looks like I don't have much done, but um, I'm actually only like 10 or 12 rows away from uh, separating from my arms, uh, like putting in the um, the bottoms of the armholes. And when I do that, I actually put this away for a while and I go and I cast on my sleeves and I work both of those sleeves up, up to the point where I would be, and I'm working those in the round. Um, I work both of those sleeves until I'm also cast off for the armhole and then once I've done that on both sleeves, then I join it all together and I'm working the entire yoke of the sweater all together, um, which from that point, it should only use another ball. Um, I shouldn't run out of yarn because I'm just about to start the third ball. I'm still only on ball number two, um, but uh, I shouldn't run out of yarn because once I get to the yoke, it should only take a ball and a half because um, it's a reglan sleeve. I'm going to be decreasing by, uh, I think, eight <laughs> every round. Um, until I get to the right height where I then cast off a bunch of stitches for the, the neck. So I'm, I'm probably fine. Um, the yarn that it calls for escapes, <laughs> the pattern calls for escapes me. It's on your screen now. Um, I do remember it is a sport weight yarn, uh, whereas I am technically using a fingering weight. It's on the heavier side of a fingering, um, but our yarn has a tendency, our superwash uh, in particular, has a tendency to bloom a little bit after it has uh, been washed. So um, I'm, I'm thinking that that little bit of bloom is going to make it so that way it doesn't look meshy and like, you can't really see me through it. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm sure that this will be fine. Yeah. Um, I am working on my knit picks, um, my knit picks needles here. These are a uh, three millimeter, no, nope, four millimeter needle. Um, these were the ones that I used to sell in my store. Uh, at Belfast Mini Mills, we sell the Knitter's Pride. I'm certain they're made in the same factory. Um, they are similar quality, and in fact, they're entirely interchangeable between the sets. So if you've got cables that work for knit picks uh, and you go buy Knitter's Pride needles, they will work together. Fantastic. But yeah, um, I also have color-coded, <laughs> some color-coded uh, stitch markers here. I don't think I ever have mentioned them. Um, so a couple of the... Uh, uh, stitch markers I've got here. The two end stitch markers are two that I got from my friend Joanne, uh, and it's from Yarn Divas. So one is just like a, a little black and copper little design, a little tag on it on a light bulb pin. Will, will it? Is it going to focus on it or my face? I think it's going to still focus on my face. What if I do this? It doesn't look like it did any change. But anyway, it says Yarn Divas on one side, and then the other one is a little little charm that has a sheep with a little crown on it. <laughs> It's really cute. Um, and then um, I have uh, two more light bulb 
uh, pins. These are two that are from my own collection. Um, and I got two black ones. And these are denoting where um, I'm doing my increases underneath the arms for the um, like the shaping. And then the final two are two little blue ones that um, these two came from Cat Montgomery, <laughs> another one of my friends. Um, and uh, uh, they are actually arrived on uh, little tiny itty bitty skeins of yarn. Um, and I have taken both of those little skeins, sorry, Cat, uh, and I used them as waste yarn for projects. <laughs> because I didn't have any waste yarn uh, available that wasn't just the yarn I was using. So um, they're no longer on there. Sorry for taking apart your stitch marker, but I'm still using the light bulb pins. These ones are blue, and they're just denoting where I'm going to be um, putting in the, the work for the actual like patterning there on the back. So uh, I just wanted to show you how I'm using my stitch markers. Um, some don't use stitch markers. They'll just use... An, a contrasting color of yarn and just tie it off and use it as a little loop. I've done that in a pinch, um, but I do like using color coded stitch markers just so that way I, when I get to the stitch marker, I don't have to go back and look which number stitch marker it is. I can just say, oh, well, this one's my blue one. So that means I'm starting this section. Yeah. Um, so I think that's all that I have to say about this one. Um, another thing that I've been working on is some spinning samples for Belfast Mini Mills. Uh, so uh, at M Mini Mills, we, um, well, first off, I hired a new staff member. Her name's Emily. Uh, she's an artist. And um, her details are down in the description. So you can go to her website and see some of the art and the other projects that she's working on. Uh, when it comes to fiber, she is a rug hooker primarily. And she has done some other yarn crafts. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, but she uses a number of different mediums. Um, and uh, what's really cool about Emily is that I'm going to butcher how to say this, but she has synesthesia, I think is what it, how it's pronounced. Um, and that's a not a condition, but it's a, an ability to see color when you hear certain sounds or think of certain words. Um, so some people see it as fractals, others see it as circles. Um, uh, so like when she hears something, like she sees color <laughs> in her head and that creates like a really really interesting um, and really cool perspective on how colors go together. Uh, so she's done a few colorways for spinning fibers for the store. So she's done a couple that are directly related to synesthesia. Um, they're only available in store right now because there's only a couple of um, a, a couple of bags, a couple of bats. Um, so you'll have to come in store or give us a call when we're open from Tuesday to Saturday. <laughs> uh, and you can see the Thursday mix or the Tuesday mix, which is just the colors she thinks of when she thinks of those days. Um, so the Tuesday mix is a, a really neat blend of like olive and um, some brighter key lime e greens mixed with uh, different grays and purples. Uh, once spun up, it'll probably make a like a really cool gray tone. Um, uh, and we have it in a bat, so you can separate it by the colors a little bit if you want a little bit more variation. And then the Thursday mix is a really moody blues and purples. Um, and it's really, really cool. So uh, come into the store if you want to see those. Uh, <laughs> and she also did a couple uh, new other spinning fibers. I've got one behind me. Um, I, I believe this was called um, Audacity <laughs> or something like that. Uh, and uh, what I've been working on uh, a little bit is just doing some spinning samples for the store. So I'm going to be doing one on my drop spindles, on my Turkish spindle. I'm going to do a, another couple smaller ones on my spinning wheel just to really get them out. So that way uh, customers will have uh, like an idea of what these items will uh, spin up in without uh, having to imagine it too too fully. Uh, this is all in our exotic blend fiber. So this is made from a blend of merino, mohair, alpaca, and silk as the primary um, as the primary fibers. But from the bag that was used to dye these colors, I do know that there's some cashmere in there, um, and there is as well as a little bit of yak and some kiviet as well. So there's a number of different fibers in here, but uh, those last, though they'd be trace amounts. So it don't be like 5% of all of those combined in this. The rest of it is, um, honestly, alpaca and mohair is the majority of this with some, with some silk and some merino in there as well. So, and you, if, if you have a really good eye, you can pick out the strands like that one. That's mohair. <laughs> you can pick out the strands and you'd know what they are, uh, cause it hasn't been super blended together. Um, yeah, it's really soft. It's going to be really warm. Um, I'm going to be doing worsted preparations for all of these because this is a worsted prepared roving um, as opposed to trying to do a uh, 
did I say worsted? I'm going to be doing a woolen preparation for these um, and spinning them woolen uh, because this is woolen uh, prepared. It's not a worsted prepare. Um, so there's going to be a little bit more air, a little bit more fuzz to the samples that I'll be spinning. But you can work, you can spin worsted style with this to make a semi worsted. Um, but because this is carded and not combed, <laughs> you'll be it's a it's a woolen prepared pencil roving. Yeah. Uh, so. The next and final thing that I want to talk about for my works in progress uh, this week uh, is an update on the lace project. So um, I did wind this into a ball using my Nasta pin. It took me five hours. <laughs> so there was a, uh, a day back, I want to say two weeks ago, where that we had like a, a winter storm, like a freezing rainstorm, and I don't mess around with freezing rain. I stay home. Uh, so... Uh, as I had mentioned last time, I had the skein, it was wet, and the skein was bigger than my ball winder. Um, so uh, actually between, it was the next day after I had talked about it on the podcast in real time, like the day that the podcast went live was the day that I wound this into a ball. And it took me five hours. What I ended up doing is grabbing the back of a chair, uh, and I started with just one chair, uh, because there's a couple little uh, felted e barts then they weren't really felted but like they were just grabbing each other well enough that I couldn't just put tension on it um and I wanted to make sure that I could like swoop in and swoop out with my nasta pin as needed but once I got past the little section I grabbed another chair used both ends of it and I just I just continued winding I started around 10 and I finished around four <laughs> and I took some breaks in there as well um so I have a cool little uh cool little dragon's egg of yarn here. Um, and uh, yeah, if you follow our Instagram, which I know I don't post as often as I should, but <laughs> if you want to see some cool pictures, uh, I did record some of the pictures of me working on this throughout the week, as well as a sneak peek of something else that I'm going to be talking about here in a minute. Um, but this is the finished egg of yarn. Um, I'm going to be working on uh, using a four millimeter needle. Um, or sorry, 3.75 millimeter needle because <laughs> I'm using my fours on my other project. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be using 3.75 needles here with this yarn um, because I want to make sure that I've got some um, open work that I can, like the, the stitches are loose enough that I can really open up the stitches of my lace project that I'm going to be doing with this. And I have a story about that. So <laughs> there was a bit of a... Yeah, a bit of a rabbit hole needed to be go, gone down in order to get the pattern. So um, I had shared with my roommate, Jesse, that I wanted to do something that was either butterfly or fairy wing inspired or mushroom inspired because of the colors, right? Um, and if you know me, uh, and by you, I mean everyone who knows me, uh, when it comes to social medias, the one that I dislike the most to the point that I think it's sacrilegious to use it, is Pinterest. <laughs> I really don't like Pinterest. Uh, I, I was never, I never really got onto it. And um, when uh, customers, when I had my own store, would come in wanting to find a particular uh, project, whenever they brought in a Pinterest page, we could never find the pattern. And that just made me frustrated for them, made me frustrated because I couldn't help them. Um, so because of all of that left a bad taste in my mouth, I don't like Pinterest. Jessie loves Pinterest. And she found something on Pinterest. <laughs> uh, so after a little bit more perusing, because I found the, because uh, she sent me the picture and I thought that was lovely, but if there's no pattern, I, it's not gonna really do me any good, right? Um, so Jessie went and went down the rabbit hole and she was able to find um, the original post. And she was also uh, able to get more information on the pattern that the person used. Um, uh, I'm gonna find all those details. I'm gonna put, those, uh, put everybody's names here up on the screen as I go through, but I, I, I didn't have time to look at that up before I lose daylight hours. <laughs> Uh, so she was able to find the original post on interest, which then linked to Ravelry. Um, and on that Ravelry page, I was able to determine um, what was just from the project notes, what uh, pattern book that it came from. So I went and I used Ravelry to find out the book. It's out of print. It is an Italian uh, lace and doily table runner um, sort of like schematic book um, that was written in the 1970s. It's out of print. So 
I tried Googling it with the intent of trying to find something on eBay. Hopefully I could find the, uh, like a copy of the book and just buy it, see what I could do. And I couldn't find anything on eBay, but because I Googled using the uh, name of the book and eBay as like a, as like a search Boolean operator, um, I was able to find a website that had digital copies of not only this book, but it was part of a series. I think there's 11 or 14 books and mine is uh, Canson 7, I think is what it's called. Um, yeah, I was able to find a, a, a website that would allow me to download digital copies of certain versions of those books, certain ones, not all of them are there. Um, but it was a little sketchy looking. <laughs> So I was a little leery, but I decided to check to see how they would accept payment. And one of the ways that they accepted payment was PayPal, which PayPal will protect my information. So I decided to pay them with PayPal. I paid eight euros, which I think works out to be like $16 Canadian or thereabouts. Uh, and I bought it and I downloaded it to my phone. So that way, if something happened and it tried to like steal some information, I could just wipe my phone immediately and they wouldn't be able to do anything. Right. So, uh, turns out false alarms didn't have to worry about any of that. Uh, so I went and I, uh, went on Staples, like Staple, the stationary company. Uh, I went on their website to do some custom printing because I had a few things I wanted them to print off. Um, and the, this was the last of three things that I wanted them to print off. And I went and I looked to see what they could print off there for me. And it turns out that the PDF that was sent to me was designed to be printed out on 24 inch by 36 inch paper. So two feet by three feet paper. And if I wanted staples to print that out for me, um, I couldn't print it double sided because they don't print double sided on poster paper. And I would have to pay for eight full size posters because it's eight pages. Um, and it would have cost well over $400. <laughs> for me to have this printed out. Obviously, I wasn't going to do that. Um, so uh, Jesse to the rescue again, uh, Jesse works for an architectural firm, and they have access to a drafting printer. Um, and it's able to print out on um, like paper that's, I want to say four feet by three feet, like just huge sheets of paper. Um, so she was able to print out um, two pages on four different sheets of paper. And I have them here. Um, so I'm not going to show you like the schematics because this is still a copyrighted work. Um, so I, I'm not going to do that. I don't know if the website that I bought this from is technically one that I should be paying for, but um, I'll let them <laughs> deal with that. As long as I don't distribute it here in Canada, I won't get in trouble. Um, so here's the page. This is two of them. Oh. Yeah, it's um, it's Bill. So uh, it is the uh, Lavori Artistica El Calza number seven. So I have get rid of the rustling paper. Uh, so I have the entire book here. Jesse graciously uh, printed out all of the pages here for me. Um, and the way that this book works is like it's. I think it's a part of like it's hard to explain because like I only have PDFs of the book. So I'm trying to imagine how this book was laid out based on these PDFs, because the first PDF is basically like a magazine sort of dealie where you can see like finished items in, it's all in black and white, but finished items. And then it tells you use this schematic on this page to find it. So um, yeah, so each of these pages have multiple schematics. The print on these pages are the same size that I would expect on like a regular old paperback, just like the text on here. And the schematics are huge. So um, they could have calmed them down a little bit. Uh, but um, it's fine. Um, if I don't end up working from the paper, I'll just use Stitch Fiddle, um, which is the program that I use to chart most of my other stuff. Um, I'll use that to just create a version of this pattern here for me. Um, yeah, so it's 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 going to work out. <laughs> so the pattern that I've decided to use here, uh, and that's based off of the other one that Jess was able to find, it's actually uh, just doing a six repeat doily effectively. Like it's a it's 
it's like a centerpiece holder. It's not big enough to be a tablecloth, but it's something that you put in the center of a table and you put a centerpiece on top of it. So it's like a doily. Um, and it is a six repeat that. So like if we were to call it a star, it's a six pointed star. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do four points of the star um, and I'm just going to do an edging on the sides. So that way um, we've got the kind of wing pattern that's there and uh, work from that. And that instead of me working in the round, like this pattern would have called for, I'm just gonna work back and forth. Um, so I'm very excited to start with this. I'm gonna be starting this uh, very soon, March 1st. Uh, this, this podcast goes up on the 27th. So in two days time, I'm gonna be starting this. Um, I do plan on recording some snippets while I'm working on this for the episode that will be going up at the end of May, because I hope to have this finished by then. Um, and in order for me to be able to do that video at the end of May, I need to. So I'm going to really, I'm going to be working at it. I'm going to be pecking on it uh, for the next three months. Um, and I thought what I would be doing is just doing a quick little video, but I thought mm, it might be fun for me to um, record myself for about 10, 15 minutes, just knitting at this, shooting the shit with you. If I can figure out how to do a live stream, uh, scream, live stream, um, I'll do that. Uh, if not, I'll just do a quick little video. Send me your questions. Send me anything that you want to uh, know about me as a person, and we'll hook them all up into the thing, and then I'll use snippets from all of this uh, recording that I'll be doing over the course of the next few weeks as the, the B-roll <laughs> for the uh, main episode of explaining this particular piece. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, I should take a quick second before we move on to the tutorial, uh, because I do have a tutorial for you today. Um, and uh, just if you like what you've seen so far, just give me a little thumbs up on the video. I'm going to try to get a little bit better at asking for subscriptions and thumbs up and likes and comments and subscribings and things like that. Um, so go ahead and give me a thumbs up if you like the video so far. Uh, so today's uh, tutorial is actually a uh, technique tutorial. This one is based off of uh, yarn overs, so how you can uh, use them, what you need to do when you're uh, yarning over into a knit stitch, yarning over into a purl stitch, how to fix yarn overs, how to tension them, um, all of these fun things. <laughs> <laughs> I was inspired to do this simply because uh, I had to look up a few things on this pattern, like doing a double yarn over and working two stitches into that double yarn over, um, which really it's, you're just working in it from back into that stitch. Anyway, I cover lots of that in the tutorial, so I'll see you in a few minutes. In today's technique, uh, I need to come up with a name for this, don't I? Uh, 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 technique, techie, tech, 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 tech. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in today's technique tutorial, um, I am going to give you some hints and tricks to work with some yarn overs, okay? Since I'm gearing up to do a lace shawl, I'm going to be doing a lot of yarn overs, um, and I just want to give you a few tips and tricks to make sure that your yarn overs are uh, what you're looking for <laughs> and uh, to help uh, help you do yarn overs, generally speaking. Uh, so if you're a total beginner knitter, you might be wondering what a yarn over is for. If you're doing lace stitches, then a yarn over is a way for you to create a, basically a hole to create open work. So I've got a couple, I've got one over here. Um, yeah, so I've got a hole in my knitting. This is on purpose. <laughs> this is on purpose. And for really beginner knitters, um, if you find that you have holes that look like that in your knitting, it's probably because you have a yarn over. So how do you do a yarn over? It's actually pretty simple. When you're working in stock and stitch, so stock and net stitch, uh, knits on the front, pearl on the back, um, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna take your yarn and you're gonna bring it in between your needles and up over. So that way your yarn's in the front, kind of like what you would do to pearl, right? Um, but instead, you're going to just go ahead and knit. And you'll notice that I've added a stitch here. And that stitch creates a hole. So that's how this stitch was created. So when you come back round, um, when you come back around and you purl that stitch, um, it is going to look like that on the front side, um, and you'll have a hole. If you put those in the uh, quote-unquote right places, <laughs> you can get uh, different designs like leaves um, and other works. This does, oh, my cord is getting in the way, this does uh, increase the amount of stitches here, because what happened is that I brought my yarn, I'll just undo this, if I hold five stitches between my fingers here. So I've got two on this side, three on this side. If I do a yarn over and knit one, 
I now have two on one side and four on the other. That created a yarn over, uh, that yarn over creates a new stitch. In your lace work, um, assuming your yarn overs aren't the increased stitches, you're probably going to have a decrease at some point in that row, since this does increase the amount of stitches that are on your work. So just keep that in mind when, when you're working with yarn overs. So sometimes you'll notice that your yarn over doesn't work. If you brought your yarn to the front and you purled and your yarn over disappeared. So the reason for that is because when you're doing the yarn over and you're knitting afterwards, um, your yarn needs to be in the back. So for in order for you to knit, you need to bring your, your yarn back and around your needle. And that creates that extra stitch. Now the tricky thing is, is that if you're trying to do a yarn over and your next stitch is a purl, so I've done a couple purls here, if you bring your yarn to the front and purl, <laughs> you're just doing a regular old purl. So what you need to keep in mind when you're working yarn overs with purls is not, you're not just bringing it to the back because you're just knitting then. What you need to do is bring your yarn to the front because that's what your next stitch would be, right? Since you're purling. And then what you'll actually be doing is you're gonna wrap your yarn around your needle to create that extra stitch and then purl. And that's how you create your yarn over into a purl. So something you want to keep in mind is that your tension between your yarn overs that uh, go into a knit stitch and the yarn over that goes into a purl stitch, the tension will be different. Your purl stitch ones, the leading into the purl stitch, that one will be a little looser. And the reason for that, when you are doing your yarn over for a knit stitch, you're just bringing yarn to the front and then you're knitting. So what's happening is that the stitch is coming from, we'll say, if we were to look at the, if we were to look at the point of the needle like a clock face, the stitch is going from effectively five o'clock and coming all the way back around to seven o'clock. So it's not making a full rotation around your needle. Whereas when you are moving into a purl, you're going from five o'clock all the way back on over whoop, to five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> to purl. So there's a little bit more yarn going into your yarn over going into your purl stitch. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't usually pop up because when you do your yarn overs, like you're going to be doing the same kind of yarn overs all the way across the row. But if you're doing a complicated lace pattern that has knits and purls in the same row, and then you have to come back and do knits and purls in the opposite row, you might, if you want to make sure that your eyelets, like the little holes caused by the uh, yarn overs are really well tensioned, you'll want to make sure that your yarn overs leading into knit stitches are a little bit looser than the ones leading into purl stitches. So now what, let's say we were knitting along and we've accidentally added a yarn over. So I've got a yarn over here that's not supposed to be here. How do you fix that? The easiest way to fix it is to drop it from your needle. You will have a longer stitch here. And what you're gonna do is after you're finished working the stitch um, and finishing that row, you're gonna go back and take a tapestry needle or another needle, and you're just going to retention your stitches to distribute that extra little bit of yarn across a number of stitches. Uh, I tend to like to distribute it across 10 stitches or so. So that way it's, it's really hard to see. So now let's say you're working your pattern and you realize, oh no, I forgot a yarn over. If you're on the back side like I am here now, you can <laughs> lift your stitch, mount it the way that um, your stitch would be, which is always leading from your working needle up over the back to your, your offhand needle there. Um, and that's how you want to mount your stitch. And then you can just knit it or purl it or however you need to work that stitch. Um, that, will be, that will result in a smaller eyelet, which you can then retention later but that is a quick way to fix that problem. So now let's say, all right, so next little repair trip, um, let's say you didn't realize that you forgot your yarn over until your next right side row. Um, a lot of, uh, I hesitate to say basic lace patterns because lace patterns don't usually ever feel basic, but, um, some of the more simplistic patterns is uh, you'll be doing a lot of work on the front side and then the back side is usually just purls. So when you're doing that type of lace, uh, you're just purling every stitch that you see. So you're not really paying attention to what's going on, at least I don't. Um, so if you come across a point where, you, you know, in your pattern, there's supposed to be a yarn over it that doesn't exist, what you can do, what you can do 
is take a crochet hook. Um, I tend to like to use a crochet hook that's a couple sizes smaller than the needles. I'm using a four and a half right now for my needles and I have a three and a half millimeter um, hook. Yeah, so all you need to do is, I'm gonna try to do this so that way you can see exactly what I'm doing. Um, you'll see we've got the ladders here in your work, right? Um, if you've forgotten to do a yarn over, what you can do is take your hook insert it between the third and second from the top. So one, two, three, in here, uh, between these two stitches, these two ladders. And what you're gonna do is you're going to pull on that stitch a little bit, and you're gonna lift it up and over your first stitch, the top stitch there. And then what I do is I rotate my, my hook, so that way I can grab that stitch, and you're just gonna bring it up and put that stitch on your needle. Now you've got an eyelet. This is the tightest eyelet that you'll have. Uh, you can fix this by, again, tight, uh, by uh, basically you're gonna steal tension from the stitches on either side to open up this eyelet a little bit. To make this, uh, hide this perfectly, what you'll actually need to do is retension two different rows of your work by stealing tension from, you know, 10 stitches on either side, because you only wanna steal a tiny little bit of tension from each one. So that way that mistake is hidden a little bit better. If you come across where you have uh, created a yarn over where you're not supposed to, you have an eyelet where you're not supposed to have, you can drop these stitches, but then what you're gonna happen, what you're gonna have is two really elongated ladders here. So what you'll wanna do is after you finish knitting a row or two, you'll wanna go back and uh, retension those stitches so that way you can uh, hide that tension issue that you've got there because there's too much stitches. So again, when you retension, Tension, retention, you know, 10 stitches, maybe 20, depending on how fine the lace is or how um, much of, <laughs> how much yarn you need to hide um, on either side. Uh, so that way there's not a huge change between the stitches. And then once you're done, you just kind of like wiggle your stitches a little bit for them to sit comfortably and the, the ladder will all but disappear. I hope you found this uh, little tutorial on how to add and remove and fix <laughs> different, uh, yarn overs, and I hope you find it useful as a resource for when you jump into your next lace project or your first lace project. All right, well, welcome back. Um, I hope you enjoyed that tutorial. Hope you found it to be useful. Um, I will be uploading this, um, well, this that tutorial will be uploaded as a separate video on the same day and will go live at the same time as this video. Um, so they're exactly the same. <laughs> um, so I wanted to, uh, uh, give you a little bit of information on uh, the lace masterclass that I want to be doing because I did a bunch of research uh, here. I fell down a rabbit hole um, and um, I have some things to report. Uh, so uh, I'll tell you that when I did my first Google search, uh, the thing that I found to give me some resources is uh, Heritage Crafts in UK. Um, it is a website that, uh, well, it's not just a website, it's an organization that uh, supports and promotes the Oh, let me just read my notes here. Support and promotes heritage crafts is a fundamental part of the UK's uh, living heritage. And it turns out that the president of, uh, of heritage crafts uh, is listed as, quote, the former Prince of Wales. So I guess it's King Charles, um, which uh, his Royal Highness's total, uh, full title is King Charles III of United Kingdom. Um, yeah. Uh, so that, that's kind of a neat thing that like the literal monarch of, well, the Commonwealth, I'm part of the Commonwealth, uh, is the president of the heritage craft. I know that he uh, was heading the, um, the campaign for wool um, as the Prince of Wales, um, but it's, it's really neat that it's, it's not just campaigning for wool as a sustainable uh, source for clothing, but he's the president of trying to preserve all of these handicrafts from uh, Scotland and Wales and the United Kingdom and um, Northern Ireland, Ireland, Northern Ireland. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I think that's kind of neat. Um, and through that source, I was able to find um, a doctoral thesis uh, by Dr. Uh, Rosalind Chapman. Her thesis is entitled, The History of Fine Lace Knitting Industry in the 19th and Early 20th Century Shetland. Um, and I reached out to Dr. Rosalind first to uh, ask for her permission to use this information. And not only did she, uh, like, I mean, she tacitly gave me her permission, but she pointed out that it's in the public domain, so I didn't need her permission, but she gave me even more resources. Um, 
Uh, so give me some more source material. So thank you so much, Dr. Rosalind. Um, I really do appreciate that. And um, I, as I mentioned to her, um, I'm going to be using this as the backbone for um, not only this little series about Shetland Lace, um, but I'm using it as like the, well, framework for me to find more sources and for me to have like a timeline. Uh, so today I'm just gonna give you a, a really quick overview where Shetland is, uh, a little bit of the history there, um, and then um, a few little, few little things that I found really interesting uh, as I was reading. Uh, so um, up on the screen here, uh, you will see a picture that I, uh, well, I, I have Google Earth on my computer. I used one of the save image uh, functions that's there. So uh, we can actually see this part of the world as a satellite image. Um, so uh, on the screen, I'm going to I'm gonna have a little pointer to it. There are a few islands, um, and these are the Shetland Islands. So the Shetland Islands is an archipelago or group of islands off the uh, northern tip of Scotland. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's north of the Orkney Islands, which are right on the northern uh, tip of Scotland. And they are between uh, the Faroe Islands, which are a Denmark. Uh, I hesitate to say own, but they are part of the kingdom of Denmark, the country of Denmark. Uh, but they are self-governing. And Norway, like the country Norway. Um, and uh, from uh, what I can find on the history of Shetland from Wikipedia and a few other sources, uh, the islands were originally inhabited by a group of people called the Picts. Um, but after uh, the Norse conquest, so we're talking Viking time, um, after that time in the late 8th and 9th centuries, um, the Isles of Shetland were conquered by the Vikings. And uh, I found it very interesting that a few of my sources indicated um, or framed how the Picts fell off of the face of history by saying the fate of the Picts after the Norse conquest is unknown. That could mean that uh, the Picts were conquered and they became part of the Vikings genetic heritage or something a little bit worse, but um, that wasn't something I could find and that answer may not be able to be found, um, at least not for some time, um, which is really unfortunate. I'm actively trying not to use the G word <laughs> because I know YouTube doesn't like it, um, but uh, I think you know what I mean by the G word, it rhymes with pesticide. Anyway, um, uh, so it became part of the Kingdom of Norway, and it stayed a uh, part of the kingdom up until uh, 1472. Uh, and the reason why it changed hands from Norway to Scotland was back in um, uh, 1468, King Christian I of Norway and Denmark, because he was the king of both places, um, wanted to marry his daughter Margaret off to King James III of Scotland. And as part of the dowry, um, he promised the Shetland Isles to uh, King James III. Uh, the, Isles were, uh, the Isles were sought after by the Scots, uh, and there were a number of um, invasion attempts <laughs> to gain uh, control of the islands, um, but the, 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 the peoples who lived on Shetland were able to defend themselves. Um, but King, uh, King Christian the first was, um, at the time having some money problems. Uh, I love how all those dramas, the Kings and all, it's so much fun. Um, it's terrible in another sense, but it's so much fun. So I feel like a TV series could be made off of this. Um, but anyway, King Christian the first was having some money problems. And while apparently legally speaking, the King of Norway and Denmark wasn't a king of lands like the Scottish king and what we know as a king uh, here in the Western world, the Western English speaking world is what I should say. Whereas, you know, the king of Britain, the king of Scotland, they owned the lands and they controlled the people by owning the land, right? Whereas uh, the king of Norway um, and some other Scandinavian countries, they were the king of the people. So they didn't directly own the lands, they directed the people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when the King of Norway promised the Shetland Isles to uh, King James III for the, his marriage to uh, Princess Margaret, um, 
the king of Norway couldn't actually just give him the land. So there is some, some money changed hands and there is a, um, I hesitate to say a pact, but there was an agreement made that if the Scots were able to um, provide Norway with uh, hundreds of kilos of gold or thousands of kilos of silver, they would be able to use that as payment for the dowry of, uh, they, were, they were able to give the isles to, uh, to King James. I don't know exactly how that all worked out because it's, the research that I was able to do was kind of vague about those parts. Um, I'll have to go into a very in-depth uh, historical account of all of that before I can get any real nitty-gritty information. But eventually, in 1472, uh, like the Isles of Shetland became part of Scotland. And uh, the Danes would regularly come and try to conquer the islands, and King James the, the Third was able to defend it for many, many years. Uh, so the Shetland Isles became part of Great Britain back in 1707 when King James VI of Scotland became the King of Ireland and England at the same time and became the King of Great Britain where all three countries were combined, including Wales. So Wales was part of England at this time, apparently. Um, and it created the Isle of Great Britain, Britain through uh, something called personal union. And that's simply because King James VI became the king of all of the places at the same time. And that created Great Britain. <laughs> so uh, what I found really interesting from uh, Dr. Chapman's research here is that um, the Shetland Isles not only were known for their lace knitting um, as being some of the finest in the world, um, but before their lace knitting really took off, their stockings, like their socks, uh, was really sought after. So some of them were, you know, plain old socks, but some of them were lace, uh, like beautifully knit lace socks. And some of these socks were sold for incredible amounts of money. Just ridiculous. Like as many as four guineas. So you might be as confused as I was when I read that. <laughs> um, because when I read that, I was like, what's a guinea? <laughs> uh, and through other... Uh, uh, other research, I was able to figure out that a guinea is 21 shillings. So uh, this was around the time where the Brits were like playing with their currency system where, you know, 20 shillings to a pound, I think it's 12 pence to a shilling. Um, so, some really weird stuff. So 21 shillings to a guinea. <laughs> um, yeah, so a guinea was worth a little bit more than a pound. Um, so that doesn't really mean much to us, right? Uh, so I went down another rabbit hole. This is this is a podcast of rabbit holes, apparently. I'm just gonna scroll up. <laughs> so um, I was able to uh, find some information. Uh, keep in mind, take all of these numbers with a grain of salt because um, uh, like trying to determine what something back then is worth now is a very, very complex um, uh, like conversation to be having. And um, my, my training is in uh, music <laughs> and I'm a self-taught knitter uh, and I'm not a, historic, a historian by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so please take everything with a grain of salt. Um, I was able to find some uh, information from Colonial Williamsburg. That is a historical city down in the States, if you're not familiar with them. Um, and there is an article on their website where uh, they try to explain how much things were worth back then. And uh, they give you a number of resources. And one of the resources they found um, pointed out um, that like it's too complicated to really try to figure out what things were equal to. But if you use this particular one that we've given you information on, if you use this particular system, uh, then you can backwards engineer uh, a yearly wage of about 750 pounds back in 1750 um, would equal out to be about $48,000 US in the year 2000. So again, that doesn't really help us Canadians and it doesn't really help us 23 years later because <laughs> inflation has been pretty high lately. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, I was able to um, use other inflation calculators uh, that are available on the, on the website. So uh, what I ended up doing is I took uh, the Bank of U.S. Um, inflation calculator. I translated 
what the inflation from $48,000 in 2000, the year 2000 would be in today's money in 2023. And then I used uh, the uh, currency exchange site um, xe.com um, to translate that number into Canadian. <laughs> and then I uh, worked it all out. So uh, I worked it out to be uh, about $7 Canadian is what a single shilling back in 1750 was roughly again, take it with a grain of salt, please. <laughs> uh, so if you work out uh, what four guineas is being 84 shillings, it uh, turns out that these uh, these stockings that were being sold back in the 1750s were selling for $615 Canadian. So $615 for knee socks, <laughs> which that for my American viewers, that is $450 today, roughly. These are about numbers because depending on where I use the inflation calculator, when I translated the money from American to, uh, to Canadian, the numbers varied. So these are approximate numbers. Um, so I found that very interesting that, um, like the poor folk <laughs> up in, uh, specifically Unst, um, Shetland, that they were able to sell a pair of stockings, which would probably take them weeks to make, but they were able to sell them for $615, um, at a time where food <laughs> was perhaps a little bit cheaper because you were make you were doing a lot more work to get your food, but you weren't spending as much money like that, that feels like a lot of money now. So I can only imagine what it felt like then. Like that would probably be enough to feed your family for a month or two, right? Uh, going further into the research here, um, uh, James Anderson, uh, who was an important thinker, uh, he was an inventor, he created the Scottish Plow, uh, and he was an agriculturist and a lawyer and a writer and all of these things. And he wrote a book called Observations on the Means of Inciting a Spirit of Natural, or sorry, National Industry. And there's a subtitle to that that's twice as long. Very long-winded man, apparently. Uh, but he notes in his book <laughs> that uh, stockings selling in Aberdeen, Aberdeen is in Northern Scotland, um, stockings selling in Aberdeen, they're selling for five pounds, five shillings to George Keith, who's a lawyer in Aberdeen, um, but stated that the Aberdeen stockings were higher quality of Shetlands due to, quote, uh, the poor people there, meaning the Shetland people, are so ill acquainted with the proper manner of sorting wool that the coarse parts of the fleece are never thoroughly separated from the fine, which makes their manufacture much less valued than they otherwise would be. Yeah, a little rude, um, but you know, <laughs> the area was a fledging producer of creators, so it takes time to improve products and they learned more because this was, this was written back in the 17, uh, about the, the 1750s. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rosalind. This is a quote. This is me quoting a quote that she did in her, uh, her uh, uh, thesis. And you can find that direct quote on page 48 in her thesis. That information is linked down in the description. All my sources are down there as well. Um, anyway. <laughs> uh, so it's very interesting. So um, at that point, uh, five pounds, five shillings would work out to be about $750 for the Aberdeen stockings compared to uh, stockings, stockings compared to the, the Shetland ones. Um, so moving on to a little bit of lace stuff, um, the oldest surviving piece of Shetland lace um, that we have access to is the John Bruce of Sumberg christening shawl. Um, and that is currently being archived at the Shetland Museum in Shetland, Scotland. Um, and, but it's not the earliest mention of Shetland lace. Um, it actually was started to pick up some um, popularity and notoriety after Arthur Anderson, who no relation to James Anderson uh, that I can find. He wasn't mentioned from what I've read so far. I'll keep you posted on that. Uh, <laughs> but Arthur Anderson was a, a merchant, a shipper. He shipped products. Um, he gifted lace stockings made by someone in the Shetland Isles to Queen Victoria. Um, and, uh, well, I sh not and, uh, I couldn't find a year that happened. I looked in a few different spots. Um, so, I don't know how much of that is like verifiably true because you don't really give a receipt for a gift. Um, and I would imagine that receipts back in the day were a little, little iffy to say the, the least. Um, but apparently uh, her love of this, lit of this knitted lace from Shetland uh, caused her to receive more shawls and stockings. And there is even a story that um, the queen asked, uh, the queen commissioned a young woman in Shetland to recreate a shawl that 
Queen Victoria had worn out. Um, so she really, really loved these shawls. Uh, so going further on, uh, the tools that are used in Shetland lace knitting uh, was pretty interesting because uh, they are using knitting wire. Um, and it sounds exactly what it sounds like. It's wire. Uh, so uh, it's basically a really thin, obviously, because it's wire, but a long double pointed needle. And it was used with a knitting belt. Um, so these wires were used so that way they can knit the, their stockings um, and they could work in the round on their shawls. Um, and the reason why the knitting belt's important is because the knitting belt is an apparatus used for knitting. It's literally a belt. It was made out of horse hair and it was made out of wood. Um, and I've got a picture of a knitting belt up here on the screen. So those holes there where you actually take the opposite end of your double point needle and you hook it into the belt. So that way you're holding your work with your hip and you're working with these two, two fingers here. Uh, so that way you can continue working while walking around. And in fact, <laughs> in fact, it created a culture in Shetland where uh, seeing a woman walking around without that woman walking and knitting at the same time uh, was looked fr was frowned upon for being idle. They're, they're, you know, Catholic and Christian idleness sort of thing back then. I don't know exactly when they changed from Catholic to Anglican. Uh, that wasn't included in this research. I didn't think to look that up until right now as I'm recording. Um, but idleness is a bad thing back then. And, you know, you had to work for everything that you had. So the idea that you had to walk around knitting the entire time kind of, for me, would suck the fun out of it. But the knitting belt allowed them to do that. So, uh, yeah, the yarn, of course, that they were using is a lace weight yarn made from Shetland fleeces. So eventually what they started doing to make this yarn is that they were only using the wool around the neck of the fleece because it is the finest of the, the fleece that's on a Shetland sheep. Um, and they would work in the they would work in the raw. They wouldn't wash the fleeces of the lanolin before they spin <laughs> the, uh, the the yarn. Um, and uh, what they used was uh, something called the Shetland spinning. It's a castle style spinning wheel, much like a kiwi, an Ashford kiwi would be, or a ladybug. Um, but it's the actual drive wheel, the, the spinning wheel that actually does, like drives the flyer. It's much, much smaller. Uh, so it could sit into a little corner of the room and be out of the way. Um, but if you know anything about spinning wheels, <laughs> the size of your, like, driving wheel compared to the flyer determines how fast the flyer can go. So a bigger wheel, smaller flyer means the flyer can move at a much faster speed. So since the drive wheel was a lot smaller, that means that it took a lot longer to put as enough, enough spin into that lace weight for you to then work it. So like you're working really, really slow. I mean, in order to get the lace as fine as they did, they'd have to work slow anyway, but like, I, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine using the smallest, like the slowest ratio of my spinning wheel to spin lace, because that would take forever. This took upwards of 20 hours for me to do this one little ball. Um, and the thread on this, like, it's, it's quite fine. Um, I'll put a picture of it here on the screen. I'm not gonna try to get it to refocus on my face here. Um, this looks really fine. And from my experience of working with lace weights, this is pretty fine. Um, uh, this worked out to be like 42 to 45 wraps per inch. So what I did is I wrapped um, a ruler around and I tried to catch, see how many strands I could fit inside an inch. And I got to about 42, 43, depending, like when you have that many, like it's hard to like line them up properly, not squish them and not stretch them. But I'm somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and when I checked the yardage on the skein, um, I had a, I have about 1200 yarns which means that if I had a pound of wool and I spun it this thin, the entire pound, that would mean that I have about 5,000 yards per pound. So that's a, a measurement of how thin this yarn is. Um, so if this, if this was a pound ball, there'd be 5,000 yards in it. Sounds really impressive. I think it sounds impressive. <laughs> Not to do my own horn. Um, but the spinners of making the, the, the spinners making this lace weight yarn were so, so very skilled. Um, to the tune that, like, this is a single ply that is 5,000 yards to the pound. Um, they were making a two ply, so there's two strands plied together, that the finished product was 30,000 yards to the pound. <laughs> 30,000 yards to the pound. So, like, their single was 10 times thinner than this, almost 12, actually. Um, so, yeah, 60, this is, yeah, this is about five. So, yeah, 12 times 
Um, so their two ply was five times thinner than this single strand. <laughs> this this single strand that looks like just a thick thread, right? Um, but their two ply was five times thinner than this. Ah, it blows my mind. <laughs> it blows my mind. Um, so there's so much work going into these shawls, right? Um, another interesting thing I saw found about the uh, Shetland lace is that one of the characteristics of Shetland lace is double-sided patterning, meaning that like when you work, like when you work the front side, you're doing pattern. When you work the back side, you're working more pattern. Where a lot of lace, uh, anything that you do now, it's like you work pattern one side of the row, uh, one side, and then you get a rest row where you just you know purl all the way across or you knit all the way across, right? Um, and then on every second row, you're doing all the pattern. Um, in Shetland, all patterning is done on both sides. And uh, something I didn't even consider, which I feel a little silly <laughs> that I didn't, but um, due to, you know, back in the 1700s and 1800s, uh, most people, most like common folk couldn't read. So these women and a few men, but mostly women were making these beautiful pieces of Shetland lace from memory like they weren't referencing any patterns some would have like gauge swatches where they would like make a swatch so that way they can go refer to the swatch itself read their knitting and uh be able to remember how to do a particular stitch and how many rows and all of that but all of the other work that they were doing of fingering like at figuring out how many repeats that they need to do across the row and how their increases need to fit and how long things they were doing that all on the fly without writing things down <laughs> without working things so pen and paper like I do. Um, and I think that's just absolutely incredible. Um, it's really incredible. Like, I know that I'm one of those people that have fallen into the trap of, uh, like, the people of history not knowing as much as we do now, that they were silly little people playing in the dirt, not knowing anything. But to, to know that, like, knowing as what I do now, that these women were able to create such stunning works that I don't think I could even produce right now, um, they're just doing it out of their mind. They're just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. Whatever. Cool. I'll do it while walking. <laughs> yeah, it's giving me a, a greater, uh, a greater appreciation of the work that they did. Just incredible. Like the, just the math skills, like the idea of being able to like, all right, well, this pattern is 16 stitches. If I need to repeat it four times across this scarf, then I need to have like, I know it's 96 stitches, but like these women didn't have a formal education like I do. Um, so they were able to do all this math just simply by road. Like, it's just, it's just what they've memorized. Um, Cause like, I mean, sh some of them sure probably could work out some math problems using a pen and paper, but most of them didn't know how to read or write. So it's just <laughs> mind blowing. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for indulging me on um, this little, uh, info dump of something that I've been working on and some some research that I've done. Um, I, I'm going to be going into a little bit more detail um, as we go on here over the next few weeks. Um, so, uh, oh, ratings. Uh, I have to give a rating. Uh, so today I'm going to give today's podcast a rating of ooh, uh, four out of four out of three and a half uh, <laughs> dropped yarn over stitches uh, in reference to the tutorial that I, I taught earlier. If you made it this far, uh, please go ahead and give the like button uh, a tap as well as hitting subscribe and touch that little notification bell so that way you get some of my community posts when I'm slack. <laughs> Uh, and definitely comment down below with questions that you may have and your ratings for the, the podcast. I love, I love reading those. Um, and that will give me um, uh, some more ideas of what I can be talking about here in the podcasts, um, what tutorials that you want to do. Please comment down below any tutorials that you want. Um, I do have like a list of the default tutorials that I feel like I should have up on the channel. Um, so I will default to those if I don't have anything. But um, I am much more interested in making tutorials that you guys will find immediately useful. So, uh, and if you have any other questions, please comment down below, especially if you are interested in seeing um, a weekly-ish video, let's be honest, it may not be every week, of me working on working on my butterfly wings. Um, if there's enough interest in that, I will commit to do, do something every week and just upload something on a Sunday night or something like that, um, uh, where it's just me knitting and talking. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I will see you next week with another full episode uh, to get back onto schedule.
Bye, guys. Shawl and found the information. Oh, oh, yawn. So she was able to find the. Uh, so Jesse was able to find the original post 